Turn in your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter 3. We, we began looking at this uh, this past Sunday morning. It was uh, July the 2nd. We were heading into a uh, 4th of July picnic, which we had after the service. It was great. Those of you who attended, you know what special time it was. Got to meet some folks, and that was always exciting. We wanted... All I was able to do last week, and, and, and this happens, by the way, intentionally. When we, when we committed to celebrate the Lord's Supper once a month, and not just tack it on as an afterthought, or try to work it in, we committed that as a covenanting people we wanted to gather monthly around the Lord's table. We know that that changes the nature of that particular service, that well, there's not the time to plow into a message like we typically do. So, so we knew going in last week that that was going to be a, an introduction to this idea, the, the true cost of freedom. Today, I want us to dig a little deeper. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. If you, stand with me if you would so I can, as I read this, we'd like to hear the Word of God. Uh, remember that it is His Word. I have a thought that if God were to walk into this room in the person of Jesus Christ and say, I have something to say, that we would probably stand. So, hear this word of the Lord. Just one verse. Paul says to those churches in Galatia, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. This is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer today is for those of us who have been redeemed, who, who do love to proclaim it, that there will, there will come a fresh rejoicing, a fresh gripping of this biblical idea of redemption. And for those here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, that you would come face to face with the fact that if you've not been redeemed from the curse of the law, then you are still under the curse of that law and subject, as we studied this morning uh, in Sunday school, subject to the judgment and condemnation of God. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week, in fact, I saw it in a, uh, in a headline this, this week, freedom is not free. That's, that's kind of a common uh, phrase, common thought. We looked last week at the, at the history of wars connected to our nation, but really if you study the history of the world, Israel was released from the bondage of Egypt, but it was at great cost. And all the pictures, particularly the final picture, was that picture anticipating what God was going to do, what he was going to spend to redeem his people, not from a foreign nation, but to redeem his people from the bondage of of sin. And if, you, if you're a historian and you read about the movements in history of different nations, you know that, that every one of them, for their survival, has had to face people who want to put them in bondage and determine either to fight out of that bondage or to fight to maintain freedom. It's, it's, it's just it's part and parcel. It's the reality of life. And so I want, last week, if you remember, we looked at, we looked sort of in a summary way at three things. First of all, redemption in our past, otherwise known as justification. Redemption in our present, otherwise known as sanctification. And then redemption in our future, otherwise known as glorification. And last week we gave you, as by way of reminder for many of you, we gave you working definitions of that, of justification. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, I am being saved from the power of sin. And then glorification, I shall be saved from the very presence of sin. So with this verse before us, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Just as it's written, if, you, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, where Paul takes this, just as it's written, cursed, in the Old Testament it says cursed by God. Paul leaves out the by God part of it. Cursed is everyone who's hanged on the tree, because he's going to be talking about Jesus who redeemed us. 
This word here for redeemed comes from one of three primary words that occur in the New Testament to teach the idea of, of redeem, redemption, ransom, bought, purchased. And this one used here speaks of being redeemed out of slavery. It, it means to buy up. In fact, the intensive form of it here means to buy up out of the marketplace never to become a subject of slavery again. To be given permanent freedom, because I don't know what you know about the slave culture of the first century, but you could buy a slave out of the marketplace and then at your pleasure sell that slave again. But there was a word used where you were buying that person to give that person freedom liberty. And they would be marked. They could never again, if they, were, if they were caught, if they were out traveling and someone said, I recognize you, you were, you're a slave. I don't know what you're doing running around, but you need to be under the lock and key of the authorities because you're a runaway slave. And they could say, no, they could produce a document that says, no, I've, I've been set free. I'm a free person now. And this even, if you remember in the, in the days leading up to the Civil War, there were occasions where where African-American slaves were given their freedom and they would carry around uh, identification that showed that this, I'm a free man. In fact, the, uh, the story, if you're familiar with the movie 12 Years a Slave, it's, a, it's, an, it's an awful but a powerful story that you need to read or watch. Uh, this particular uh, man was black and he was free and he was kidnapped and sold illegally sold into slavery and for 12 years was there when he should not have been. He was a free man. This word here in our text, Christ redeemed us. He bought us out of the slave market of sin. Not so he could sell us again. He bought us out to set us free so we would never again be slaves in that way. This, there's another word. Uh, it's it's the, the same word, but not the intensive form of it. 1 Corinthians 6.20 uses this. Paul says, and we're going to get to this in, in our study in 1 Corinthians, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. This word means to, to buy in the slave market. Secure a slave from the bondage and cruelty of cruel slave masters. You, you need to know, surely you know the history of slavery. Slavery was awful in this country, but there were some slave owners who were merciful people. Some of our Baptist forefathers, in fact, one that I can remember inherited several hundred slaves from his father. He was faced immediately with a dilemma himself personally against the idea of enslaving a person. He could have set them free, but in that climate to set them free would have, would have doomed them because they were absent of uh, the skills of making it on their own. And so he kept them and cared for them and nurtured them. One of the early catechisms our Baptist forefathers wrote was, a, was called a catechism for colored people, catechism for the Negro. And they would, they would teach and instruct the slaves. <clears throat> a church I pastored, First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana. You go back and read through the record books about their membership. And they had, among their membership, slaves who were members. I'm not trying to glorify or deify slavery. I'm not trying to do that at all. But I'm pointing out to you that there were people who found themselves in a position of owning slaves who were merciful, kind. This idea here is to buy out of the marketplace of that, of that cruel slave market. We were slaves to sin. Jesus paid our ransom price with his blood. And Peter will talk about that in this, this third word. 
The third word speaks of paying the ransom price. Look at, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18, knowing that you were ransomed, and there's the word there, from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold. In other words, what you were ransomed with was, was imperishable. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He paid our ransom. There's a big debate in theological circles, and some people don't like the idea of substitutionary atonement. And they say, well, who did he pay the ransom to? Did he pay it to God? What's God doing holding Jesus off? Well, did he pay it to the devil? And that's, that misses the point entirely. Because God is the one who, as we read responsibly, set forth Jesus. He's the one who offered him up to rescue us. So it misses the point to go after those, those asking questions that the Scripture doesn't answer. We need to spend our time rejoicing in what the Scripture does say. The same kind of ideas in Titus 2.14. Talking about Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem. It's the same word, by the way, as is translated ransom in 1 Peter 1.18. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This idea here is to, to liberate a slave using ransom money, to, to set free by the payment of a ransom. The idea of being redeemed from the curse of the law, as our text says, is that we were under bondage. Remember our first parents, Adam and Eve, were told in the garden, you may eat of any tree, the fruit of any tree in the garden, except this one. You may not eat of it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. It was a commandment by God. This, the, People focus on that, but remember, he promised them so much in the garden. The garden was virtually theirs to enjoy. There was one prohibition. And if you have been honest about your sins at all in your life, you know, you know, in fact, you've, we've raised children. No, you can't. No, you can't somehow summons in the, in the creature a, a stronger desire to do. And the enemy of our souls, the devil, coming as a serpent, used that prohibition and said, God knows that when you eat that, you're going to be just like him. You won't need God, you'll be your own God. Basically, he was saying, God's insecure, God's arbitrary. God's an ogre. And he knows when you eat that, you won't surely die. He's a liar, too. And they took and ate. The rest is history. We all fell in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, As in Adam all die. It goes on to say, So in Christ all will be made alive. We all fell in Adam. We fell under the judgment of God, under the curse that the soul that sins shall die. So every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve is born dead in trespasses and sins. Paul says in Romans that, that such a person uh, will not subject himself or herself to the law of God. In fact, he says such a person is incapable. Neither can he or she subject himself or herself to the law of God. It's in the nature of People say, well, isn't a person, isn't a son of Adam, a daughter of Eve, free to become a Christian? Yes, we're free to become Christians just like a bird is free to build his home at the bottom of Skytook Lake. So that's nonsense, preacher. No, no that's the... You see, the bird won't do that because he has the nature of a bird. Now, change his nature to the nature of a fish, he's there. Every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve is free to become a Christian. But the nature of every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve is contrary to that and set against that. There has to be a change of nature. There has to be a settling of the, of the law of God. So we're under the curse. And our text tells us that he redeemed us from that curse. 
So I want us just to see for a few minutes here. As we, we looked last week at 1 Corinthians 1, 30, that, that because of him, that is because of Jesus, because of, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. We've just studied this recently. You, you should be familiar with that idea. Righteousness. He's our justification. Sanctification, he's, he's the one who causes the Spirit to indwell us in the new birth and who continues to conform us to his image. And redemption, he has purchased us and that purchase continues to be valid. We're going to see that, how it plays out in the language of the Scripture. I want you to see these three tenses we talked about last week. Redemption and our past otherwise known as justification. Look at Galatians 4, 4 and 5 with me. Paul says, but when the fullness of time had come, at just the right time, when the Roman law held sway through the known world, when the Roman road, so there were these terms we learned in, in, in high school, first of all, in my, in my Latin class, and then saw them again in seminary, the Pax, the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, the Via Romana, the, the Roads of Rome, the Lex Romana, the, the Laws of Rome. When all those three things in God's providence came together where you could travel the roads under the relative peace, the peace brought by, the, by Roman rule, uh, when all those things came together in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law. So he was subjected to the law just like you and I are. Well, for what purpose? Here's the purpose. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. There's that picture. That's justification, by the way. I've told you before the picture that sticks out in my mind in justification is that if you are guilty of a crime and you're taken before the judge, a righteous judge, and your crimes are presented to him by the prosecutor, and you know you're guilty. There's no getting out of this. You, there's, you're caught dead-handed, red-handed. It's, it's just there. The judge is a wise judge. He's not going to be fooled by clever arguments. And there you stand, guilty, condemned as charged. That's how every one of us is before the just judge of heaven and earth on our own by nature. And before the judge pronounces sentence, Someone steps up to the bar, a man, and says, Your Honor. In fact, he says something even stranger than that. Father, I have paid the penalty. Whatever sentence you pronounce on this one, I have paid that penalty. And I ask you to set this one free based upon the fact that I have paid his or her penalty. And the judge, for the sake of the son, who, who proves infallibly that he has paid it, the judge who will not be guilty of double jeopardy, punishing one person for a crime and then punishing another person for the same crime, punishing one person who did the crime and then punishing another person who stood in the place of that one. He will not be guilty that he's a just judge. For the sake of his son, he declares you and me not guilty. And he accepts us as if we had never sinned. We stand before his court declared not guilty, free to go. That's justification, folks. It's a one-time event. It doesn't happen over and over and over. If you're saved here today, it's because at some point in your life you were brought face to face with your sin and convinced you were a sinner deserving condemnation in hell, the wrath of God. And yet being convinced of that, sometimes almost simultaneously, you become convinced that one stood in your place and paid that penalty. So that God, as we're going to read in a minute, could maintain his holy justice and declare you not guilty, justify you because of Jesus Christ. And if you're not saved here today, if you've never come face to face with your, you can. You can look God square in the eye and confess your sin that you're guilty as charged and ask for his forgiveness based upon Jesus Christ, Jesus' perfect life, his sinless life, 
His substitutionary death where he died, becoming, as our text says, a curse for us. What Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 5, that reconciliation, that great exchange. He who, he who God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You can claim that today by grace through faith. But it's a one-time event. You don't need to be justified again. In fact, we need, to, we need to clean up our language, folks. When you experience, as a Christian, experience difficulty in your life, get rid of this devil's lie that, well, you're just being, God's just punishing you. If you're saved, God puts your punishment squarely on Jesus. And the only way he relates to you is not as a judge ready to punish you, but as a father who will correct you to make you more like his son. That's justification. That's what this passage is talking about. So you see the next thing that happens when we are justified, it says so that we might receive the adoption as sons. I've given this picture before. There you are in the courtroom. You've just been declared not guilty even though you know you were guilty. You were deserving of whatever, of, of the judge throwing the book at you and you were declared not guilty and accepted as one who had, had never committed a crime. And you turn to walk out and you hear the judge say something strange. You hear him say, my son, my daughter, you wonder who he's talking to. You realize he's talking to you. He's adopted you. He's going to take you home to raise you because of what his son has done. That's what this text teaches. To redeem us so that we might receive adoption as sons. Well, another passage, we'll look at this briefly. We read it a while ago. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. But now, Paul says, now, this righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, you're not made right before God by keeping the law because none of us has, none of us does, none of us can, and none of us will. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. This righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is for all who believe. There's no distinction, he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This word fall short of this term, fall short of the glory of God, is a picture of missing the mark. I love one of my professors in seminary did this one time. We were talking about how you miss the mark, how if you were an archer and you drew back your, your, your arrow and your bow and you had a target in front of you and you shot and you missed the mark. That you, hit, you wouldn't hit the bullseye, so you missed the mark. He said, well, that's kind of the idea. He said, but you got to, to, to get the force of this term here, take that same target, that same bow, that same arrow, that same archer, draw it back, and then turn around and release he said, that's the picture here. Not just barely missing the mark, completely missing the mark. All have sinned, coming up short of the glory of God. And then he says this, and just as all come up short, all are justified the same way, by his grace as a gift through the redemption of that is in Jesus, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. That the word propitiation is a big word. It means a, a sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing, a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. Because see, Christ on the cross satisfied God's divine justice by his suffering and, and dying in our place. To be, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, that God is holy. We talked this morning in Sunday school about God doesn't wink at sin. And he's patient, but he's not a pushover. And the day's coming when he will enact his righteous judgment and exact the full penalty upon those who will not believe, who refuse to believe. That he did this because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. He hadn't winked at them. Jesus was going to be the one to satisfy those sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present so that he might be just, he maintains his holy justice, and be the one who justifies the ungodly, those who have faith in Jesus Christ. This again is justification, clearly. Redemption secures our justification when by faith we receive it. Secondly, I want you to see redemption in our present, this ongoing sanctification. See, he did redeem us from the curse of the law. This redemption continues to have an impact on us. Look at Titus 2. We read verse 14. Well, look at 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, 
bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness. See, the grace of God is not a passive idea. The grace of God is a, is, it replaces that strict tutor of the law. Remember that picture in Galatians where the law is a strict taskmaster who drives us to Christ? The grace of God appears as a sweet teacher and tutor. And it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives now in this present age as we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. So watch, he didn't just redeem us from the curse of the law, the penalty of the law. He redeems us from the power, from the power of sin, look, to purify himself, a people, for his own possession, marked out as zealous for good works, wanting to be known as those who are excited, delighted, willing to do service. To not only follow Christ and love God with all of our being and love others, but serve the world who, who are zealous for good works. You see, redemption, redemption, the impact of it is to continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse us, from, to deliver us from glory to glory, as Paul says, one stage of glory, one level of glory to another. And you know that if you've walked with Jesus Christ any length of time at all and you are a true follower of Christ, you know that your life is one where you're being delivered, daily delivered, weekly, monthly, from things that held sway in your life. That's this work of redemption in our present. As we experience the ongoing sanctifying effect of the Spirit indwelling us, as the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us, Paul said, John says that in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to be cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Are you growing in grace? Are you growing in grace? Is redemption having its gospel effect in your life? You've been saved by the one who gave himself to redeem you from lawlessness, that is a living a life contrary to the law of God. And to purify, that's the word sanctification, comes from a word grouping of, of the, the hagiadzo to set apart. To be set apart from sin, set apart from the judgment of the law of God, but set apart unto holiness. We're, we're holy vessels. Increasing in that. Redemption having that effect on you. And finally, redemption in our future. Glorification. Look at Luke 21, 25 to 28. Jesus is teaching about the last days. He says in verse 25, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Just stop, think about that a minute. You seeing that today? Droughts, floods, great weather on cataclysmic scales. Nations distressed. People fainting, verse 26, with fear, with foreboding of what is coming on the world. You know people who are, who are living with anxiety about what the future holds? For eight years people lived in this country wondering what's going to become of this country. Now folks on the other side of the aisle are living with fear, wondering what's going to become of this country. And then folks who were fearing for eight years what's going to become of this country are fearing, well, what if, what if these rebels, what if, what if this whole spirit of antinomianism holds sway? What's going to become of the country? Fear. 
nervousness, anxiety. So the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Jesus says these things, these things are going to happen around you. And heaven itself will be shaken. And out of heaven will come Him, the Son of Man. And He will come not this time carried in the womb of a young maiden, placed at birth in a stall, a cattle stall, cleaning out where animals feed so that he'd have a place to lay his head. No, not this time. Coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, he says, straighten up. In other words, there's no place for a believer who believes the Scripture to walk around, woe is me. And I say this, I, I rebuke myself, and sometimes I, I find myself heading that direction. No place for it. Jesus says, straighten up. Look up. Not only look up physically, but look up metaphorically. People say, oh, it's awful. Not for long, we tell them. Not for long. Things are horrible. Not going to always be that way for those who are looking for Jesus. Well, you're a fanatic. That's fine. But which one of us is looking up? Which worldview you want? The worldview that goes around moaning and groaning and woe is me and doom, doom, doom? Or the worldview that says, you know what I know about today? I know today that he's a day closer to coming than he was yesterday. I know that infallibly. Don't know when he's coming, but I know it's a day closer than it was yesterday. He says, look up, because your redemption is drawing nigh. What's he talking about there? He's talking about this idea that we have been purchased with a ransom price that has lasting effects that we will, we will yet see. Think about this. We will yet see the effects of Jesus' redemption, the cost that he spent for our freedom. It has a future aspect. We shall be saved from the very presence of sin. Remember, just remind yourself. Remind one another of that. Man, did you read what happened? Yeah, that's awful, isn't it? Thank God it's not going to always be that way. There's a hopefulness that comes when we think about the fact that we've been redeemed. He says, you've been redeemed. You're being redeemed. Look up your redemption. The ultimate implication and impact and effect of your redemption is drawing closer. Paul says the same thing in Romans 8, 22 and 23. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Until now. That's how, you're, that's how you're to see when you have the weather channel on and Jim Cantore is standing somewhere trying to stand up and not be blown completely away by these ridiculous winds of, of some storm system coming in. And you look at all of that. You go, yeah. <laughs> Jesus said it would be this way. Paul said it would be this way. That's just a groaning. The earth is groaning. And not only the creation, he says, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. In other words, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up together in the clouds. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. As in Adam all died, so in Christ all be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, and then who are His at His coming. We become the first fruits. We groan inwardly as we do what? As we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. We've been adopted. Papers are signed. Already beginning to experience some of the value, but there's a day coming. Think about, 
Think about how difficult adoption is for you and me now because we're still struggling with remaining sin. But the day is coming when we are taken to glory and sin is not even present. Sin is not an option. Think about how, how quickly we will conform to the image of Jesus Christ to take on, we will know Him as we are known. We will see Him and be like Him for we will see Him as He is. Waiting for that adoption as sons, Paul says, the redemption of our bodies. We have been saved by the blood of Christ from the penalty of sin. We are being saved by the blood of Christ from the power of sin. And we shall be saved by the blood of Christ from the very presence of sin. That final redemption. The final movement of redemption. So Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We're to keep in step with the Spirit. We're to, we're to live as repenting people, repenting of our sins, forgiving others when they sin against us, trusting in Christ daily. That's, that's the Christian life in a nutshell. Believing Christ, believing the promises of God for us. Repenting when our sin is pointed out to us, either by where we see it, the Spirit points it out, someone who loves us enough points it out. Repenting of sin. Others sin against us, we forgive them. It's the, it's the practice, it's the movement, it's the rhythm, it's the rhapsody of the Christian life as we move that way. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit because you grieve Him when, you, when you're not practicing trusting Christ, when you're not practicing repenting of sin, when you're not practicing forgiving others who sin against you. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He says, by whom you were sealed. We're looking at the Holy Spirit on, on Wednesday nights in prayer time, different names and descriptions for Him. We just recently looked at this idea of Him being the seal, God's stamp upon us. Where's this package going? God has stamped it. It's going to heaven. We're sealed for the day of redemption. So there's this picture now. The redemption draws nigh. Waiting for the redemption of our bodies. This day of redemption when we are taken up by Jesus. Remember now that happens one of two ways. It happened to Dr. Bill Cook last week where he was taken home to be with Jesus. When Jesus comes, he will take all of his people who are alive and remain until his coming. But each one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ... Jesus tarries, we will one by one face him and be taken up by him. This day, when we finally taste and experience the full, unmitigated blessedness of being redeemed by the blood of Christ. So I ask you this as we close. Because this is the cost of our freedom. How will you use your freedom? Both as a follower of Jesus Christ, and as someone who's been blessed by God to live, it's, it's terribly imperfect. There's things happening in our nation that um, the founders would roll over in their grace. But we still live in the greatest, freest nation on the face of the earth. How would you use your freedom as a follower of Jesus Christ and a citizen of the freest country in the world? Well, Peter has a recommendation for us. 1 Peter 2.16 Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Watch this. We're set free from the slave market. But you know what Paul called himself throughout his ministry? A servant of Jesus Christ. The word he used often was this word doulos, who was a, who was a base slave. See, Paul recognized that while he'd been bought out of the marketplace of sin and the ravages of sin to serve a cruel taskmaster, the devil, that he'd been bought to be taken into the family of God. And it was his high privilege to serve, to be a servant. Too many people today, you know them, I know them. They claim to be Christians. They have, quote, liberties that just shock me. C.S. Lewis said one time, so the, way, the way that many professing Christians live, heaven would be hell for them if they were to make it because they live every day without regard for God and the things of God and the people of God. If, if heaven is going to be one continuous, glorious gathering around the throne, we read it last Sunday, Revelation 5, worshiping God, worshiping the Lamb, what should we think of people who say, ah, I don't need church. Really? 
You've outgrown something that eternity is going to consist of. C.S. Lewis said, heaven would be hell for them if they were to make it. And he goes on and says, and the way some people live just wantonly, pagan, adulterous lives, hell would be, and he puts this in quotes, heaven, because you know hell's not going to be heaven. But they would feel much more at home. There. Peter says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up, an excuse for evil, but living as servants of God. How are you going to live? Francis Schaeffer asked it years ago, how shall we then live? And if we're going to embrace and appreciate the true cost that God spent in the blood of His Son to deliver us from the bondage of sin and set us into the glorious liberty as sons of God, how will you live? How will I live? I pray God will help me to live to the end as making the most, taking full advantage of the freedom I have in Christ and the freedom we have in this country. 95% of Christians have never shared the gospel with another person. I mean, just intentionally sat down and shared with them. 95% of Christians have never seen another person come to faith in Christ. Are we really making use of the liberty we have in Christ? All my prayer, brothers and sisters, is as we move forward in the journey together, wherever that is, whatever that looks like, then it could be said of us, look how they are making the most of, they're maximizing their freedom that they have secured in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for them. That's my prayer for you, it's my prayer for me, that we will live as free people and not carry on as if we're still in the yoke and the bondage of the slavery of sin. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and so grateful for the blood of Christ that you were willing to give your Son, your only Son, your darling Son, to redeem us from the curse of the law. And you were willing to let him become, in your sight, cursed for us. We remember his cry, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Oh, dear Father. May we, who have been saved by grace through faith in the blood of Christ, may we not live in a way that looks like we have abandoned you. Let us live for him who was willing to be abandoned by you. Let us make the most use of our freedom. Having been redeemed from the penalty of sin, manifest that we are being redeemed from the power of sin. Looking for the day, longing for the day, aching, groaning for the day when we shall be redeemed by the blood of Christ from the very presence of sin to be with you forever and ever. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.